I have a shameful secret. Despite many years of rescuing and restoring vintage computers and also evangelizing the first decade of the IBM PC, I know shockingly little about basic electronics. I can't tell various capacitors apart, I have almost no soldering experience, and I haven't memorized the color bands on resistors. So imagine my utter shock and surprise when I was able to put together this. This is the 6502 40th Anniversary Computer Badge. It was designed by Josh Bensadon, Lee Hart, and Daryl Richter. And it is an entire 6502 computer on a badge. It has 8K of ROM, 32K of RAM, and even runs its own custom version of BASIC. As you can see from the scrolling message on the front and the silk screen on the back, this is the Vintage Computer Festival Midwest Specific Edition. And if you happen to attend VCF Midwest, you'll probably see me walking around the show wearing this very badge. But what makes this badge really special is that I put it together. Now when I look at a badge like this, I think there's no way I can possibly put that together. But under the tutelage of my friend Mike Lee, he was able to guide me through the instructions, figuring out where all the parts went, and basic soldering and electronics building techniques, and this badge worked correctly the first time. And that really helped me get past my fear of picking up a soldering iron. And I thought that was such a useful thing to do, to get past the fear of breaking something or screwing it up or not understanding what you're doing, that I thought I would make this tutorial video along with Mike. So in this video, we're going to hopefully get you past your fear of building electronics projects by assembling the Vintage Computer Festival Midwest badge. Okay, now before beginning any project, it may seem like common sense to lay everything out and make sure that you have everything, but it bears mentioning. You should, in fact, verify that you have all the parts that you need. And for this particular project, one of the things that I learned that really makes soldering go much nicer is to use a really good quality solder. In this case, we're using a Kester 6040, and it has a rosin core. And one of the things I learned too is that it's easiest to build these projects up using the smallest components first. That way the board can mostly lay down flat as you're building it, reducing the need for you needing like a pair of helping hands or something like that. So here we're installing R4, which is a 33 ohm resistor. And this other resistor is R2. Now one of the things you'll see us do is use some masking tape to hold components in place. Cute little trick. Not really necessary at this particular stage with these components being so small, but later on when we get to the larger components it actually helps out a lot. Now you may be wondering why we slowed down the video here to show you clipping off the resistor leads. Uh, that is because we're actually saving them. See how we're keeping them off to the side here? Uh, resistor leads, uh, and actually the leads of any long component that you use, uh, make great jumper wires. And in fact, we're going to be using some later on for just that. Next, we're moving on to the diodes, and there are three of those. Now, diodes only allow electricity to flow in one direction. So by their very nature, they're polarized. So you have to observe the correct polarity when you put them on the board, as we're doing here. Now, the polarity is marked very clearly on both the diode and the board, so putting them in the board is as easy as making sure that they're stuck into the board the way the board actually looks. Now these are actually staying in there pretty well without the need of masking tape, and that's because the leads are fairly thick. But another trick uh, that a lot of people use if you want the component to stay put while you're soldering it is to slightly bend the legs outward a little bit so that it can't fall through. So now we're moving on to the capacitors, and these are the 0.1 microfarads, and there should be four of them. These particular capacitors are going into holes C2, 4, 5, and 7. Now, earlier with the diodes, I mentioned polarity, so you might be wondering, well, capacitors have polarity. Should I observe polarity when putting these in? Well, it turns out that ceramic capacitors don't have polarity, so it doesn't matter which way you put them in. Now 
Now on these particular legs, Mike made a little bit of a mistake. So uh, we decided to leave this into the video and not edit it out and show how to use a solder pump. A solder pump is a suction pump and you prime it by pushing down on the plunger and then you heat up the solder with a soldering iron, put it right next to the liquid solder and then release the pump and it just shoots right up. And uh, they're really cheap, they're less than $10 uh, and you don't need a fancy one to do simple rework like this. And here is the 0.01 capacitor for C8. And we're also doing the 3900 picofarad capacitor for C6. And finally, the 0.56 microfarad capacitor in C3. Now we're going to be installing the resistor packs. Uh, these are essentially uh, resistor ladders. Uh, and they are directional. They're labeled with a dot, which must go towards the marked part of the board. The first one is R1, and it's labeled L83S223. And the second one is R3, and it's labeled L83S222. So very easy to get these mixed up, so please double check. And this little blue guy here is the resonator, and it goes into Y1. You might be wondering what a resonator is. I didn't know when starting this project. It turns out it's like a crystal. It uh, produces a regular frequency when, when you put current through it. But unlike a crystal, it's made with ceramics. We're all out of small components, so now we're going to move on to the next higher height components, which are the IC sockets and the RAM. Now remember when we held onto those leads, uh, which you see clipped off to the side there? That's because they make great jumper wires, and in fact we need to install a few for the particular size RAM that we are going to install on this board. Now we're using jumper wires instead of actual jumper blocks because the RAM is not something that we are going to be changing frequently on this board, so it's okay to get away with using some jumper wires. Uh, for the exact jumper wire connections that you need to make, uh, please consult the assembly listing for this board. A link to that listing and the project in general is in the video description. To prevent the possibility of shorting or touching other components, always pull your jumper wires all the way through. It also looks really tidy on the top if you do that. At this point, we're going to put in the RAM chip, and uh, sometimes when you get RAM chips or any long IC uh, directly out of a tube, uh, the legs are sort of trapezoidal, they're not parallel to each other. And fixing this is pretty easy, as you can see here Mike is uh, rolling the chip very gently against a flat surface, and that bends the pins uh, all uniformly, uh, all at the same time. Now there are jumpers you can install right here if you want to change the size of the RAM, but because uh, we are not going to be changing the size of our RAM, we're not installing any jumpers there. And here's another technique Mike showed me. When soldering an IC or something with long rows of pins, do the corner pins first. Here you can see him doing the two corners. 
Uh, that way it tacks the IC down to the board and then you can visually inspect it to see if it's flush, if it's the right orientation. And if you have to undo it, then all you've done is soldered down two pins and you don't have to go through this massive hassle of, you know, de-soldering uh, all of the pins to get the, the chip off. And what's happening here out of frame, <laughs> unfortunately, is uh, Mike inspecting his work. You should always double check to make sure that you don't have any shorts between the pins or any other mistakes. A lot of sockets have this, these center braces for support. On our particular board, we don't need them. Uh, they get in the way. And on some boards, you may find that you have a socket that doesn't actually match the size that you need on the board. So here you can see another kind of a silly little trick. Uh, simply take the socket apart. You don't need these center support struts. All you need is the long row of socket pins. Now in our case specifically we did this because the ROM fits over the RAM on this board. As obviously with any badge, uh, space is limited and uh, the braces would have simply just gotten in the way so there's a little trick for you now when it comes to the 6502 socket we leave them in because there's no reason to take them out Before soldering down all the sockets, it's extremely important to make sure that pin 1 is aligned. This will usually be a notch in the uh, socket itself, and uh, pin 1 should always be indicated on the board too. And if not, uh, always look at the in assembly instructions for the board that you're using. This is important because these notches are going to guide uh, the user if you were not building the whole board completely, and yourself later on, uh, as to the correct orientation of the chips that go in them. And uh, hopefully it should be obvious that uh, plugging a chip in a board backwards can cause uh, anything from failure of operation to uh, letting out the magic smoke. So after soldering all of our corner pins, making sure that everything's all good, we go ahead and solder the rest of it. This is a bit of a long sequence in the video, so I thought I'd uh, drop another tip that I learned during this instruction for me, is that uh, sometimes the temperature of the iron isn't nearly as important as the type of solder that you use. I mentioned at the beginning of the video we're using a 6040 solder with a rosin core, and I was always taught that you had to do something really hot, something like 360 or 370 degrees Celsius with your iron in order to melt the solder uh, properly, but it turns out uh, you can get away with 300 or 320 if your solder is good, and that's great because it also means l uh, less damage to the components. Only one capacitor left to install. This one is polarized, so you have to observe the polarity. Uh, it probably doesn't need to be said, but in case you were wondering, the plus is positive, the minus is negative, and uh, those are marked on this board, so it should be very difficult to make a mistake here. And just in case you can't quite see the markings, uh, sometimes these components have a longer leg and the longer leg is positive. Now it's time to install the switch and uh, the switch can be installed in any orientation. Now we're going to install the jumpers. And uh, one is to specify the type of CPU, which is described in the manual. And the other jumper is used to describe the size of the EEPROM. Finally, we're going to install the highest component on the board, the header for Serial. Serial is the interface you use to interact with the board. You can write new basic programs with it, you can change uh, the contents of memory, inspect memory, and so forth. 
We interface to it via a small USB adapter, which you'll see at the end of this video, and a link to that adapter, or one very much like it, will be in the description. And here we have this spare little LED panel. Um, this is uh, sort of a strange little LED panel in that it's not entirely uniform, um, but it is, however, cheap and uh, is just sort of a little bonus added to the badge by the original designer. Uh, soldering that is very easy as long as you get the orientation correct. It's just like soldering an IC. And that's it for all of the integrated components on the board. At this point, we're just down to installing the battery holder uh, and the jumpers. Now, soldering loose wires through a board can be a little tricky, so one technique is to tin the ends of the wires, that is to get a little bit of solder on your soldering iron, and then just coat the end of the wires with solder, and then that makes them very stiff, and you can then push them through the hole on the board. And then here uh, you see sort of tinning again. Mike is putting the wire through the board and then uh, dripping a little bit of solder on it to get it to stick, and then later on he solders it for good and clips off the ends. Now's a good time to install the jumpers so you don't forget to do so and wonder why the board does not work. Now if you look at the back of the battery holder, you'll see Mike has put a layer of electrical tape across the back of it, and that is because it's to prevent uh, electrical shorts. Uh, the wires run across the back of that battery holder, and if for some reason the insulation were to melt or something crazy, uh, there would be a short. So a, a little layer, one layer thick of electrical tape will prevent that. And now we're installing the chips, and because we made sure to uh, orient the notches in the correct position when we put the sockets in, all we have to do is orient the chips notches with the notches in the sockets. I like this area of the uh, video specifically because it just seems so weird to be putting a 6502 CPU in a tiny homemade badge like this. Now you'll notice we're putting in IKEA rechargeable batteries, and this is okay because we installed the resistor, at least in this assembly video, that allows these batteries to be recharged through the badge. And we turn it on, and it works right first time. How about that? The basic ROM contents include a very small uh, version of BASIC made for the badge. It was previously mentioned called BASIC A, uh, because Canadians A. And uh, the ROM also comes with a sample basic program that auto starts when you start up the badge. So that's what that little scrolling uh, VCF message is uh, when you turn it on. Now securing the back of the battery holder to the back of the badge is up to you, but uh, we decided to use every hobbyist's friend hot glue. Now take a look at the orientation of these wires. This is being done in between the pins on purpose. Uh, to prevent a short. Uh, these pins can actually push through the insulation. So when you route the wires on your own board, make sure that they don't go over any of the snipped off leads, or after a couple of times with pressure, they would poke through and uh, you'll short and you'll wonder why your board's not working. It may not be pretty, but it does work pretty well, although you should probably let the glue cool a little bit first before you decide to stick it on. Always double check the wiring. Here you can see Mike uh, visually inspecting to make sure that the wires are not getting uh, pushed onto any of the leads. Uh, as previously mentioned, we really don't want a short. If you wanted to be extra careful, you could put some uh, heat shrink tubing on these wires, uh, give them a little bit of extra padding. And with the installation of batteries and a quick flip of the switch, we have ourselves a fully functional Vintage Computer Festival Midwest badge. We dim the lights a little bit so you can see uh, the uh, eight-segment display and strange Cylon-like bouncing LED in all of its glory. And uh, there you have it. It seems really complicated when you look at it up front, and I was very intimidated by it. But 
Uh, following these instructions, uh, at least very similar instructions that Mike gave me beforehand, I was able to assemble it just fine. And uh, I've, as I said in the introduction, I am a complete novice at this kind of thing. So this really helped me get past my fear of trying to uh, put together some homebrew projects, and I hope it will help you as well. Here's the aforementioned USB adapter, USB to serial. Um, it's real easy to just simply stick in there, and, uh, and then you can just stick it into the side of your laptop and program away. Now for more information about the badge, including where to get the board design and a components list and uh, instructions for flashing it, etc., please look at the links in the video description. And I hope this was interesting and informative, and most importantly, I hope that, like me, you can get over your fear of putting together electronics homebrew projects. <laughs>